along with Colby Everett, who is the editor-in-chief of the journal this year, have done a really terrific job. Uh, so my thanks to them, my thanks to uh, the entire uh, student membership of the Journal of Law and Public Policy. Uh, my thanks also to Professor Rick Levy, uh, who is one of the faculty advisors. Uh, he and Uma Alka, who you will see uh, later, um, uh, they uh, act as um, uh, an advisory role for, for this group, so my thanks to them. Uh, we've uh, experienced an enthusiastic response to this year's uh, topic, uh, restorative justice. It is a topic that is worthy of a publication that, from its very inception, uh, has been all about uh, approaching important public policy questions from multiple perspectives. Uh, the organizers have put together an impressive lineup of speakers that include not just legal academics, uh, but also uh, those who participate directly in the justice system and, and those who have been directly affected by the justice system. Uh, my thanks to the keynote speakers uh, for being here. My thanks to all of the speakers. I will not uh, mention them by name, but they will be introduced throughout the program. But I do want to say on behalf of my faculty, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, participating in this program. Today's event is sponsored by the Judge Timothy Nelson Stevens Fund. This was an endowed fund established by Judge Stevens' daughter, Kate Stevens, who graduated from the law school in 1975. Uh, she set up this fund in memory of her father, who is a district judge for the state of Kansas. The fund's purpose is to, and I quote, commemorate his learning in and faithfulness to the laws of the eternal and of men, his loyalty to our American institutions, and his endeavors for the ethical advancement and stabilization of the state of Kansas and the School of Law. So here we are, 44 years later, uh, still grateful for the generosity of Kate Stevens uh, in memory of her Again, welcome. Thank you all for being here. And I will now turn the program over to Colby Everett, the Editor-in-Chief. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the annual symposium for the Kansas Journal of Law and Public Policy. Just looking around this room, I am so proud, I'm so honored to have all of you here. It's truly going to be a spectacular event. Restorative justice is about rehabilitation, reconciliation, and resolution. However, there can be no restorative justice without the pain, suffering, and survival that precedes it. Today is about survival. It's about the women and men who endure the unspeakable only to find out in bed ready to attack another day. It's about those who have been broken and pick up every single piece. It's about the individuals who leave the past and take up the new. That is why we're here today. Survival is about strength, it's about hope, and it's, a, it's about action. And we intend to showcase that action here today. You will hear from legal professors, practitioners, experts, social science professors. You will hear from a state senator, judges, former judges, and a courageous survivor. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the forum. This is where we act, and it is small steps like these that allow us to put the past behind us, find our inner resolve, and make restorative justice part of our lives and part of our culture. With that, I'd like to introduce to you Judge Rosemarie Aquilina the, from the 36th Circuit Court of Ingham County, Michigan. Judge Aquilina knows survivors, she knows hope, and she knows restorative justice. Thank you so much.
But we know that many of the people I see will go to jail or prison. And so the question becomes, how can you have restorative justice then? How do the two meet together in resolution? And it is difficult once it's in the jail, prison, judicial system. But it's not impossible. When I let both sides speak, and they actually get to face each other, I have defendants who understand I've actually hurt human being, and I didn't know it cut that deeply, and I'm terribly sorry. I also have defendants who will never be sorry, and they go into prison, <coughs> as you watched with Mr. Nasser. Victims, and I don't like to use that word, because truly by the time they come to court, I hope they are survivors, and by the time they leave, I know they are survivors, and they thrive in their lives, because they've actually faced the person them. And that's the important part of that. There's a number of pieces of things that I do. I always let every single victim talk because victims, survivors, in order to turn into a survivor, and they need to talk. And it's not just about the actual individual who was assaulted, whether it's sexually or home invasion, but it's also about the people that love them, that live with them, that care for them. They are also in a state of shock and pain, and they need to find a way to survive. So I let everybody talk. I get grief for this. I've always gotten grief for this. Thankfully, because the world is watching in the Nassar case, uh, most, I can't say most judges contacted me, but many judges contacted me and said, I've watched what happened, and I'm going to rethink what I do. There were a few, however, who did contact me and said, how dare you? Well, okay, they get me off the bench. I am always going to let everybody speak. I know that it works because when defendants hear, not always, but usually feel something, and they change. And I invite them to come back because people come back from prison. They come back, all come out of jail, not prison, but many come out of prison, and we need to treat them right as well. And we don't want them to sit there and be angry I order treatment, there's things that can be done in the prison, but not enough. But I tell them they also matter that they're worth something. Come back and show me what they've done. And when you treat a defendant equal, when you listen to them as well, they come back, at least they come back to me. They bring their healthy babies. They show me their GED certificates, their college certificates, the music they've written, the music deal, the art. And they should tell me that I was the first person in their life that told them that they mattered. Can you imagine that, being an adult and a judge in a black robe with a gavel with not a really happy face? <laughs> tells you that you really matter and you can do better and that you, you were meant for great things. If you can do this crime, you certainly can do the other side. You can choose greatness. And they come back and they show me the greatness. So I try to do restorative justice within the confines of the law and being fair and impartial to both sides. And I also recognize the importance of every single person affected by crime talking in court uh, to judges. And I'm hoping that legislators across the country will take the Crime Victims' Rights Act and specifically say that a victim isn't just the count pled to, but a victim is anybody affected by the crime. In the Nasser case, I heard 156 sister survivors, as I called them, but I actually ended up listening to 169 because I listened to parents and coaches and other people. And you could see and feel the healing in the courtroom. And with that being said, I want to introduce, I have an introduction for her, but Trinae Gonzer, her and she can tell you of her experience, because she was uh, assaulted by Nasser, probably the oldest case. And she can tell you in her own words, but I want to tell you that when she spoke to me, and understand I listened to 169, it was her case, her voice, that resonated so profoundly with me, but also with defendant because what she essentially said was almost biblical. It was, my friend, what have you done, essentially. 
wasn't exactly chicken tummy, but it was that was the meaning. That's what I heard. My friend, what have you done? And she told him about how she was hurt, how he had single-handedly ruined himself, being a family member to them and a friend. And it was the only time out of 169 that I thought somebody got to him. And if you watch the sentencing over the seven days, he wrote a letter, he didn't pay attention. There were all sorts of things that told me he didn't get it, he wasn't remorseful, and he still thinks what he did is treatment. The only one that really got to him was training. But when you're talking about restorative justice, I think it was her approach. I think it was my friend, what have you done? That instantly brought tears to him. That instantly showed he was having some kind of light in his head that what he did was wrong. Let me turn it over to Jane. Do you want to introduce her? Yes, so good morning. My name is Paula Bustamante. I'm the managing editor of the Kenyan Law Journal. Um, now, we've all heard of Judge Aquilina. Um, the Larry Nasser case made headlines around the nation and the world. Um, and as she just said, there were 100, over 150 sister survivors. And Trinae Gonzalez is one of these sister survivors. Um, she's also a mother and a wife and a former gymnast that excelled in her sport in Lansing, Michigan. Um, she's currently the director of development at the Wayne County Safe Sexual Assault Forensic Examiners Program, which is the same program that processed thousands of undetected rape kids of, for the city of Detroit. She is a BA from Columbia College Chicago and has lived in many parts of the world, India, Italy, Puerto Rico, Africa. She currently lives in Detroit uh, with Justin and her son Ashton, who's one of the cutest babies I've ever seen. <laughs> um, she was featured on the NPR podcast Believed, um, which took uh, the Larry Nasser case from the investigation all the way to the sentencing. Um, and if you get the opportunity to listen to it, I highly encourage it. It's very impactful. Um, she received the Arthur Ashe Award at the ESPYs, um, carried on to Ashton and that award. Um, she received the Humanitarian Award from Global Sports Development and received the Humanitarian Award from the EDGA Foundation. She's a tireless champion and advocate for sexual abuse victims and all those that are impacted. So before we get into everything today, I just wanted to give some content warnings for this panel. Clearly, we're going to be talking about sexual assault and violence and abuse, including child sexual abuse. Given the statistics of sexual assault, it is likely that you're going to have a personal connection to this in some way. Um, so just know that any reactions that you may experience are completely valid. Please know that if you experience any re-triggering based on our conversation, um, you can exit the room at any time. We have confidential advocates here from the care center that are waiting in the back of the room. You can just raise your hand. Um, they're available to speak today, um, not just today, at any time. Asking for help is always an okay thing to do. With the very real world experiences many of us have had with sexual assault in mind, please be respectful when we get to the question and answer portion um, of our speakers and the rest of your audience. Thank you. So to start, I'll get you guys some chairs because we're going to be sitting here. And I'm wearing details, I know you guys are too. So Judge, I know you kind of touched on this, but I'd like to hear from both of you. How do you define restorative justice and who is it really for? I think restorative justice is for both the survivor and the defendant, their families and their communities because when we get people talking and they start to heal. I know that with the sister survivors and for 15 years I've been a judge, a civilian judge. I was in the military, um, Judge Advocate General, 20 years, the first female judge in the history of the National Guard. And it happened there too when I had cases um, where people actually talked. And sometimes I would bring in the chaplain or um, the inspector general or whoever in order to help facilitate discussion to see is this a crime, is this for feelings, what happened. Clearly, what I have in the civilian world are crimes. And so, where does restorative justice fit? Well, 
I need to hear from survivors what they want. I need to hear from them what happened. I need them to know that I believe them. In these sexual assault cases, it is often, <coughs> far too often, that someone comes forward and the family goes to the predator. And that person is all alone and not believed. So it's really important that however it comes to me, I believe, I listen, I engage with them and help the dialogue in the courtroom. And I always ask defendant, what would you like me to know? And that is a real tell if they are open to being rehabilitated, if they understand they, they committed a crime, or if they have nothing to say. It helps me determine punishment. Restorative justice, hopefully, is that both sides heal, and in a courtroom, I like to talk to both and tell them they matter, and this shouldn't define them. When they hear it from somebody who's not their family, it helps spring forward the healing. And for defendants, it varies. For very young defendants, sometimes they just didn't understand that no really means no. We have all of these effects. We have social media, we have bullying, we have this macho behavior on television, and we're telling young men that that's okay. Well, as women, we know it's not. We need to change the culture. So we can, when we get young people, we can reformulate their way of thinking, and oftentimes I hear why they did this and what they thought, and yes, now they know it's wrong. So it gives me an absolute avenue to say, here's what needs to happen in rehabilitation. So I see restorative justice as a healing point, as a treatment point, as a safety for the survivor and for the community, and hopefully a safety net for the defendant so that this never happens again. My hands are more tied in, as a judge than if we were in, for example, mediation, because there's certain rules I have to abide by. When I was a practitioner and to, I went to a lot of mediations, I handled mediations, I had cases that I thought never would there be resolution, and there was, because when parties actually talked, there was good that came out of it. And statistically, and you may all know this, but I truly have seen it in my courtroom and in my practice, with restorative justice, people own what they say, and they own the decision, and they own whatever happened between them, but I'm sorry, and I'll do better. When a judge mandates, it can be a divorce, it can be a divorce settlement, it can be a crime, it doesn't really matter what it is. When a judge just issues that punishment, people don't want to comply. And that's because they don't want to be told what to do. Now, for sex offenders, we can't always not always, it's never, for a true sex offender, it's not about sex, it's about power and control. And sometimes we can rewire, but oftentimes we can't. So restorative justice, we need to rethink what we're doing there and how we're handling it. Uh, long explanation, a lot of pieces to it though, and I can go on, but I want to turn it over to you, Trini. Um, for me, when I went into the courtroom, I didn't understand that restorative justice was kind of happening for me. Um, I went in basically wanting to have a conversation with him, and um, I only went public two hours before I spoke. Um, mostly, I did that because I knew that there were going to be older teammates that were teammates of mine that I needed to be able to reach, and the only way that I could do that was if I went public. But I also knew going into that courtroom, based on what I had been seeing, his reactions that were happening to the previous ladies that were speaking, um, wasn't him, and um, I knew that if I spoke to him and that was his same behavior, that he was already dead. Something that he was gone. And um, so when I went in there, I had written a letter to him, um, basically what I would have wanted to say to him. Um, and to be honest, I, I still think about what he would have said back to me. I think about it all the time, like what, because I could see in his reaction that he was very upset because this was between me and him. Like, I love her, but I didn't know her, and I was a little scared of her at first. 
Um, so, I, you know, I fumbled my words at first, and um, I knew that it was going to be something bigger because about 10 minutes before, I really didn't let him see me too much before I did go up. Um, I could see that he was already stopping hysterically to me and mouthing to me, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And so I may never get that res response from him, um, but I might like to have been approached by him. Um, if you were to, if anybody would maybe be able to talk to him, it might be you. Um, but I think for me it's an interesting space what happened in the Japanese program because I think a lot of uh, the survivors, that was a closing door for them. Um, for me, that was a closing door. Um, I think that's when my dark, darkest days started to happen, was after that. One, because I thought I killed him. Like, I knew that he was kind of going on suicide watch. I didn't see his reaction. He was completely hysterical. Um, but I don't think I would be where I am now if I didn't get that opportunity or to have that opportunity. I think there would have been a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of really um, heartbroken days for me where I knew then that he knew he had done something wrong. And I knew prior to me, I don't know that he did. I think he really had to just kind of straight face. But I knew with the things he did that something changed. Um, and I would love to have that. Sorry, so that. That is the number one question that I hear from survivors is why. They all want to know why. And they're not going to, in most cases, get a satisfactory answer. How do you answer why? Because the answers that defendants give about why is victim blaming and shaming. And it does not usually help the survivor. And I think that with their relationship and and Trinity's approach, which is more of this um, restorative justice approach, which she didn't even know anything about. But her approach was just so on topic, in tune. It was what we would hope somebody would do is, my friend, what have you done? And it really opened the door to him. It was that window inside of him. But I've never heard a defendant say anything as to why that really helped a survivor. The help is in facing, being able to face them. Usually, um, defendants don't have money to pay restitution. Uh, the restitution, as I see it, is in allowing each and every person affected to speak in the courtroom, have their time, as much time as they want, over how many days. This isn't the only case I've done this in. This is just the most public case and most people. I do it in every case for 15 years, so I've seen the results. And so I, I know there's very little likelihood of money for therapy or anything else they've done to the survivor. But just having to face that survivor and the survivor seeing that, yeah, that why question will never be answered, it's okay with them because they have a public opportunity to take back their power. And that's what this is about, taking back your power and control from someone who took it from you. So, Trina, you jumped into restorative justice without knowing really what it was. Now, in your role in Wayne County, um, how, what do you want to your role in the role of restorative justice now? Well, it's to be sexual violence. But like, for me, if I was talking to you about this before, if I was raped, um, especially by someone I don't know, just someone in the street, um, I maybe would want to have that conversation with them about what they did to me, but I don't think in that case I would want their response. So, um, like with what, what we do with sexual violence, 85% uh, of what we do is in a country. Sometimes, unfortunately, it is a family member. Um, so, I think for that space, for restorative justice, I think probably would be super beneficial. It is with what we go through, but a lot of times our survivors don't even get to that place. You don't actually get that far. Um, but I think I can speak to that better now. But I think in the survivor's mind, the idea of facing their abuser is, is pretty intimidating. Um, so I think that there is a lack of courage in that space that they can do that. And I think that's a little bit what happened with us and why 
media was so attentive to it was because they were thinking in mass, just one after another after another, having that conversation with this one person. And I think that that gave a little bit more to survivors that are out there now to have that conversation. Judge, um, I know that you mentioned that there have been criticisms of you allowing um, these victim impact statements, particularly over a week. And you say you've been doing this in your courtroom the whole time, so mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on, on those criticisms? I know you, you touched on it a bit, but could you expand on that? Sure. I believe that I'm paid by the people, and it's the people's court, and that they have their opportunity for whatever reason when they're attached to a case to be in that courtroom. Unfortunately, uh, and I've had criticisms even from my staff, they want to go to lunch with their friend. Um, other judges want to go, go on the golf course. When I'm there, I'm there eight hours a day, ten hours a day. I'm there when I'm needed because that's what I'm paid for. And I think that the people should demand that. So I've had criticisms about, well, you can't let everybody speak. Why not? Appeal me on. Get me off the bench. In fact, I'm the largest vote getter in the county. <laughs> <laughs> so I think people will be upset if I walk off and start lobbying for the change. And I'm doing that anyway. I, I'm meeting with state senators. I had a meeting last week with the state senator to say, look, let's expand victim because we know what victim is. The Victims' Rights Act, it defines victim. But we need an expanded um, definition because judges don't believe that what I'm doing is right. Now, I've had a number of calls from judges and emails saying, I've watched what you did, I've seen the effects, I'm going to rethink what I'm doing. But I've also had a handful, thankfully it's only a small handful, say, how dare you? And you think that's really sad. Um, I mean, you know, law enforcement has been good about it, but even they say, well, how, how many more officers do you need? How much more time do we have to spend? This isn't about dollars. This is about lives. We need to start putting humans before dollars. And that's a problem. So I'm going to keep doing it until I am told I can't, and then I'll walk off the bench and lobby for it. And I'm hoping that when you all vote for judges, it's sad. In Michigan, I don't know how it is here, but in Michigan, judges are the last people you vote for. Some people don't even make it to the back of the ballot because they don't know who to vote for. You, if you're going to con be in contact with anybody, it will be a judge, because you have a traffic ticket, because somebody dies in this probate court, because, because there's lots of reasons. Get to know your judges, who they are. Are they going to listen to you? Are they going to follow the law? Will you have your fair day in court? It's important to spread the word. Thank you. Um, Trinae, what are your thoughts on how did you feel directly afterwards when you got to give this victim impact statement? I blacked out. <laughs> Not like physically in the fall. I didn't remember a single thing that I had said. Um, I did feel heartbroken. Um, I think that that's um, as a result of the person. Um, but I think also, too, it was necessary. I think um, not realizing that I needed to have that, um, it was the first step in opening, I was referencing, it's like a can of worms for me, um, that I didn't know was really deep inside me that I needed to open. Otherwise, it, it would have just festered, I think. So I don't think I would be where I was, where I am today if I didn't have that opportunity. And I don't think many of us would be. I think that there's a, there's something about us because there's so many of us, and I think people assume that everyone's great now and everyone's okay now. Um, that is very not the case. Um, but there is levels of recovery and journeys that you have to take to get there, and I think that that's truly, um, it was the first step for most, most of us to just getting over that hump of how do I get better and how do I get through this. So do you think that restorative justice can go too far and end up hurting people it needs to help? Possibly. Um, again, I always go back to, in my mind, and what, the work that I do, I think that in restorative justice spaces, criminal, other spaces that are maybe not so sexual, um, and then depending on the circumstance, I think that it really does, I mean, if it's my father, um, 
I, I, I can't, it's hard for me to put myself in that position just to, because I try to do that when I answer something like this. I really try to put myself in the position of what would that be like if I was raised by my dad or um, a person on the street that beat me to almost death, strangled me, because that's what we see a lot of, um, to the point of passing out, where you're going to die. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult for me in that space to envision putting a survivor in the space with a person that almost killed them and then finally reached them. Well, and to piggyback on that, there are circumstances that I don't think it should be used. For example, uh, there are a number of pregnancies that result from rapes, and babies are born, and the moms love those babies. And then rape is about power and control, so how does the power and control continue? That person gets out of prison and files for custody. Now there needs to be laws in every state that says you're automatically terminated. However, you can pay for that child that you created, because what happens is the public will pay, oftentimes these young women can't afford, and so they ask for public assistance, and then prosecutors get involved. And then there's a whole process by which then they go after the father for the money, and the father counters and says, yeah, well, then I want to see the child. Well, if it's a product of rape, and we know that, we don't need restorative justice. We need justice saying parental termination, and yes, you will pay for your child. Pay back the community as part of your restitution. So we're a little backwards there yet in some of the states, and I have been contacted by thousands. Still today, if I open up my phone, I will have more contacts. People around the world have contacted me about all this, and I've heard from many women about the backward system we have in regard to custody fights where a child has resulted, and that turns my stomach. And it's unbelievable that they have to go through this at all. Child is born out of rape, there should be an immediate from the termination of the dam. How does that work in Michigan? In Michigan, there would be a parental termination, but um, now what we're finding with all the DNA tests, all right, sometimes they didn't know that it was who the rapist was or they got it wrong, and then the rapist finds out, and maybe the statute is wrong, and now they're filing for custody. So when there's domestic violence, we have it's one of the best interest factors, and they wouldn't get parent time, they could be cut off. But it's a long process, and imagine being raped, and then going through this. Why should they be victimized? Because that, they're being made victims. So we've, we've just got so much more work to do. So thinking about restorative justice and sexual assault, um, do you think that we are treating uh, male victims uh, and trans victims the same in the restorative justice context, or do we still have work to do on that? We have a lot of work to do, I think, and as I go around the country and have been asked to speak, when I talk about um, Me Too and Time's Up, I remind people that this is not a, a woman's crisis, it's a person's crisis. Mm -hmm that we all need to partner, men and women need to partner together. Me Too does not exclude men, it includes men, right? Women, we're inclusive, aren't we? We're not an exclusive club. We include people. So we need to really have this message that it's really we too. The LBGT community, um, any community that's not just straight and white, you know, we need to open up and look and say, how can we help? In our jail, two weeks ago, I had a man who was transitioning into a woman. And I don't even remember the crime he did. It was something like a retail fraud first or something. It wasn't even that big of a crime considering what I see. And they put her in isolation because there was not an appropriate place in the jail to place her. There is nothing worse than placing someone in isolation. We don't even do that in war crimes unless it's necessary. And we do that in the jail when it's necessary. We have to treat people as human beings. Again, making people human, making us all equal and starting from that position. Why are people starting in lesser numbers because of the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their race, their sexual preference? 
we need to fix that. Our legal system, sadly, I think, is broken. Mm -hmm. um, we see this constantly with what um, we do, and we've actually been really focusing on um, marginalized communities, you know, Arab American, Asian American, the um, LGBTQ community, because there is a, like, we have a rape that goes into a hospital. And it's even in the medical, unfortunately, because you'll have these um, doctors that are in the emergency room that don't know what to say, don't know how to handle somebody that is transitioning. Um, and there's certain stigmas and um, associations with that that they assume that because they're LGBTQ, LGBTQ, that they are extra sexual or they were at a bar to, you know, there's a lot of things that go into those stereotypes that you have somebody that's just been assaulted, that's in a hospital, and they're being treated as a queer because of their transformation. Um, so there's a lot of education that needs to go into these kind of spaces, aside from the restorative <coughs> justice side or the law side. I mean, in a medical standpoint, because if you have been raped, you, you are a woman, you're transitioning as a man, how do they handle you? The other thing is for men, uh, men report sexual assault at a much less rate because we have this machoism and it's not cool to, to say I was raped. There, there are any number of men who are raped, boys who are raped, and they need help in the same way. We need to have safe places for all persons to come and to believe them and to not ask questions. The questions, even judges, I've heard judges ask questions like, well, why were you in the dark alley? Well, why were you wearing that? Uh, why, did, why did you say that to him? What, why would you ever do anything in your conversation to blame someone who's been assaulted? And we really need to have these safe places and start a conversation with, from the time children are born, until we die, from the janitor on the CEO, every single person needs to be retrained in their thinking, in their approach, and in, if something is reported to you, what do I do? Because ruining the evidence or shutting someone down with a question is not acceptable any longer. Or just silencing somebody when you ask that question. Because you, as the survivor, you automatically realize that you're, you're the one that's looking at the You're the one that's the only one. You've done something wrong because you walk around. Um, and with what we do with our work, 85% of what we see is, is women. Um, but we do see 15% and um, what we're trying to start encouraging is men's groups, but not just men that have been abused, men that want to stand behind women and or men to have that conversation about sexual violence. Because truly, and I say this most men, if women could have fixed this, we would have. So we need the men to help us make that better. And that's a really important conversation for a man to understand that he can hold his buddy accountable at the bar for groping something inappropriately or touching someone's butt. I mean, come on. You know, you, you know that those things happen, and um, that's really the first step of making change. Um, but we're trying to encourage men to have that conversation and to come to a safe space where they're not going to be judged, they're not going to be asked the question, well, why didn't you say something to your buddy who drugged her? You know, why didn't you? Because again, that's another form of victim blame. They don't know how to handle it, so they just shut it out. So what do you see as the future of restorative justice? I think we need to have people understand what restorative justice means, is where it begins, how it's handled, uh, where we can find it. Uh, attorneys often don't think about restorative justice in cases other than perhaps divorce mediation. And so we need to expand the ground. And we need to have training with doctors and people like Trené in, in her office. Um, and say there are people who are trained who can help both sides heal. And we're not trying to um, blame or shame. We want both sides to understand that you 
pass this bill forward, but until they hear each other out, it may not happen. I think it's especially important when you're talking about sexual assault, the restorative justice in the schools, because there is there's so many young people that I see, and they get um, we have juvenile waivers. So if the juvenile does something, they can be waived. Um, if they're 15, they can be waived up to my court, um, or 16 up to my court, um, and have a felony instead of staying in the juvenile system. And sometimes it really is just retraining because, as I said earlier, there's this thing about okay. People are having sex younger, well, and they think it's cool, they think it's necessary, they've got to have a woman, they've got to have a guy, or whatever it is, and they don't understand that you don't just grab someone because you're on a date and match body parts. You just don't do that. There is friendship and dating and courting, and there's the word yes. And if somebody seems, even by a little troubled, you say no. So. I think that restorative justice could start in the schools at an early age with things like bullying and other things we see, and then we'll see it lead into other areas. There has to be a beginning, and I think we could even do this in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Um, I think, it, especially in what I'm doing, the younger the better, um, because I think that we have an expectation that the judges know or the attorneys know what restorative justice is, but here I am working with survivors, and now I'm taking into a space and they have no, no idea what that is or what that means or what that could benefit or how it could look. You know, there's a lot of education that needs to happen on both sides of things to make people understand what it is that they're getting into and how it can help them. But I think truly in all things that we're talking about, the younger the better. And I know people are a little nervous even I have a small child thinking about talking to a kindergartner about sex or sexual assault or sort of justice. I think there's ways you can do that, that starts that conversation for them as they get older, where it's really going to change the culture, because that's really what needs to change. And in the professional setting, so we could ask legislators to say, okay, with licensing for doctors, nurses, teachers, uh, child care providers, you must take our restorative-based class or credits, whatever it is enough, the experts can say this, I'm not an expert in it, but whatever classes and phases are necessary, as an add-on to their license. And if for those people who are already licensed, how about continuing education credits that must be done within a certain time period about restorative justice, the proper terms to use, how to treat victims, because it's at epidemic proportions. Let's stop the epidemic, but we have a lot of holes to plug, and I think that would really help. Because restorative justice doesn't work in every case, but it does work and it does help. How do you explain restorative justice to survivors in your organization? Well, I don't say restorative justice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think sometimes the bigger terms are a little, um, especially when you're in a crisis space, I think it's a little bit more confusing when you talk technical. Um, and I really say let's have kind of a mediation um, in a sense because I feel like you have a certain idea of what mediation is. Um, that we can sit down and you can have your feelings and your thoughts about what happened to you and you can tell them. And, but I do want you to be prepared that they will respond or they could respond. And either you're going to hear what you want to hear or you're not. In our case, we didn't. But in some spaces, some, you know, some people do feel true remorse and I think that, I can't say too much, but had certain universities done the right thing, they would have saved themselves a lot of money by just telling us we're sorry. Mm -hmm. And I think as a survivor, all you want to hear is they are sorry. And if a survivor can move one step forward by getting that, restorative justice is a really important part to your journey. Let me just say, because, and I'm just going to say his name, John Engler, I don't know if you've ever you've read, but he became the temporary president of Michigan State. And he made some very nasty statements that got him off, thankfully. Um, should have been done sooner, but anyways, he made some statements that the sister survivors were really in it for the money and for the media. I promise you, I didn't know any of these girls. Now they're like my family. 
I promise you there isn't any parent, any husband, any wife, any one of these survivors who wouldn't give back every single moment if this never happened to them. We need to get rid of that thinking that people are just in this for the lawsuit, for the money. It has nothing to do with it. But does it make a statement? Yes. Does it help? Yes. Do they have a lot of needs? Yes. They have triggers. Some of them can't work. They're suicidal. They're in and out of facilities. They're bulimic. They're cutters. They need help. And there's not a pot of money that is legislated for these type of crimes. So I'm sorry it goes a long way, but I can tell you there's not one survivor who's ever done it for the money. I'd like to open the floor up for any questions at this time. How can you teach kids more about conversing with each other when they're on the phones all the time and not learning how to converse about anything? Maybe we need a PR person to put this out on the social media and get the kids talking. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that except that I know that, you know, my kids, I have five kids, 37, 36, 18, and twins who are, will be nine in a few days. And the nine-year-olds, I have taken away their iPads and said, you can only use social media, and they're not doing all the Facebook and all of that, but they're playing video games. I said, you can only do that on the weekends, and you can do it at the table, it has to be limitations. And I think that's really a parental guidance responsibility, but yes, my 18-year-old, I can't take away her phone. I mean, she'll just, She'll go buy a new one. She'll figure it out. I don't know. She's very smart. But um, why don't we? Here's here's something. If I have a new ice cream product, I'm going to hire a PR firm, and they're going to saturate the market so that it's competitive. Briars or whatever brand you like, right? Why can't we do that with this language? Why can't we saturate the market? There's all sorts of media are supposed to do. Uh, things for nonprofit advertisement, whatever. Why can't we say for every segment? The legislators could pass this. You want to use the airwaves, then you'll have a percentage of this that will counteract the bad that's out there. We have a dark web. Why is that there? We need to put out messages about talking, how to talk, where there's safe places. Like we have those little cards in the bathroom that nobody picks up. Right? They're, they're there in the girls' bathroom. You probably have them in the men's bathroom. I've not been in one. Um, <laughs> but they're there, and they're there in yellow and all of that. But why not have something on the internet that flashes? If you need, if there's domestic violence, sexual assault, here's what you do, here's who you call, here's the language. And why don't we say it's okay in the schools to use body parts, vagina, breast, penis? I had one of my law clerks, um, she has three kids now, but her first one, I'm like her mom, she lost her mom when she was very young. And she was referring to her daughter's vagina as a tutu. And I said, why are you doing that? She said, well, that's what it, my dad always referred to it. I said, well, we're going to stop that. You need to use the right terminology. Because if someone says, she, your daughter says, my tutu hurts, or my tutu's broken, or someone touched my tutu, would any of you be alarmed at that? No, but if they say, someone touched my vagina, someone, you know, took down my pants and touched my vagina, you're going to call CPS, you're going to call 911. Now, interestingly enough, this is how much training or retraining we need in the schools. This girl is now five years old. She's in kindergarten. Her teacher said to the whole class, boys and girls, draw a picture of a boy and girl. She was the only one in the class who drew an anatomically correct boy and girl. <laughs> well, what happened to her? Instead of a teachable moment, which I would have done as a, I've taught for 30 years, I would have said to that little girl, you know, look around the room, we're all wearing clothes. You've done a lovely job. If somebody is naked like that, we need to tell somebody, but right now, could you make a pretty outfit for each? Instead, that little girl got called into the principal's office, told she was wrong, and the mother got called. Why? She was shamed. She was blamed for something that we all should know and talk about openly. Why aren't we doing that? And why do we have to ask parents permission as teachers to do that? Now, I teach at the, you know, 
law school level. But I have taught um, in my younger years in the in the uh, high schools and grade schools. And you know, parents have a lot of control, and we should as parents have control. But we also know that teachers end up raising the kids half the time. Why not let them use the proper words? Why does a teacher have to ask permission to use a proper word? Kids need to feel safe everywhere, and they need to use the proper language so they can get the proper help when they need it. Well, and honestly, social media, like in the work that I do when we talk about human trafficking, um, people always envision it's going to be in the grocery store parking lot or the target aisles that somebody's going to follow you and take your child. Um, trafficking is more done through social media, Snapchat, Facebook, um, Instagram, private messages, and we're really, we're starting a parents group for parents to understand what social media does, um, what access to text. You can send a beauty message because the boy at school asked you to send him on if you're in sixth grade, and you send it and then you can delete that message. So your parents can't see that that's happened. So we're, we're really trying to start really facilitate that conversation of what social media <coughs> capabilities are when we're specifically talking about sexual violence and or human trafficking because parents have no idea what's happening on those phones. Snapchat immediately gone. Um, and then unfortunately that's where trafficking is, is in social media. Those children are getting a text message at 10 o'clock at night that they're going to be picked up at midnight and they leave their house, they come back at 2, they go back to bed, the parents never knew that they left. So, and that's trafficking. That, it doesn't have to be that you're tied up in a barn where it's a continue, it doesn't have to be that. Trafficking is just as simple as you sign somebody up to go have something with them for an hour and then you get to go back home. That is still trafficking. And it happens, it just happens so often through social media outlets that as we're talking about social media, we're talking about just exactly as you asked, um, how to control what they're seeing and what they have access to. And to be honest, take it away. <laughs> as a mom, like, that's probably not going to happen. Just learning what I'm learning, that does happen through social media. It's, it's really scary. There needs to be law enforcement um, should also be involved in the community and teaching, having parental classes about what's on the, the web, um, what are some of the things like, for example, and I hear a lot about it in court, and I think, geez, how is it I didn't know this, but there's a phone number that a kid can give you, your, your child can give you a phone number and say, I'm going to Susie's, yeah, you can talk to her mom, here's the number. And then that number rings, it's a real phone number in your real community, but it brings to nowhere. So then when Susie comes home and says, uh, and mom says, well, I couldn't get through, oh yeah, her mom's on the phone all the time, or the phone's off the hook or whatever. So you never know. You actually, when I release my daughter, um, and my, my teenager calls herself Rapunzel, because I, <laughs> I double check everything. I make sure I talk to a human being, and then I know what address and where she's going, because I know that phone number. Uh, thing is out there. There's a whole lot of other things on the web that parents need to know. Police officers know these things. Attorney generals know these things. They go on the web and they pretend to be 15, 14, 13, and we discover a lot of people like that. Um, but we need that education and continuing because the media out there and the, the web and what you can do out there increases and it's more and more dangerous. So if you want to take a step back a little bit, Trinae, I know um, during your sentencing, which was very impactful, you talk, you refer to Larry Nasser as your friend. You said, my friend, what have you done? Can you kind of expand on that a little bit and why that came to mind as a phrase that you wanted to use during sentencing? Um, well, he was my friend. Um, he was my friend for like 30 some years. So um, there was, a, I talked about being the older group, there were some of us that were with him five days a week. He was our trainer. Um, I was a gymnast at Twist Arms in Great Lakes and Lansing, and he was um, our trainer. So he taped every ankle, wrist, shin, um, shoulder, eating guidelines that we had. I mean, he was with us 
five days a week, um, which then progressed into um, MSU Sports Medicine Clinic, where he could you know, have a little more of a medical facility to help us with. Um, but he was my friend. I was at his wedding. I knew his wife very well. I watched his children grow. Um, and I wanted him to know that I was there as that person. Because a lot of the other ladies that, and I, and I understand where they were coming from, because they saw him in a medical space. So they went in, they got their throat checked or whatever. And you go in to see a doctor, and you leave. And you go get your medicine, and you feel better. So for us, we had, we had to be able to compete on an injury and perform. So when you have somebody that's taping your wrists and your shins and your ankles and making you safe to compete and to win, um, why would you question anything else that they're doing? So a lot of the ladies that spoke before me were very angry, and, and their statements were very, you know, you did this, and you were a doctor, and just very angry. And I wanted him to know that I was there completely as his friend because we were friends. He was my friend, and I was... Um, completely heartbroken that this was my friend that I'm having to have this conversation with. I, I, I can't say it any other way than that. Like, I was so sad that this is who I was having this conversation with. And I needed him to know that I was there in that space, not just a space of, I hate you, I'm mad at you, and this is what you did, and you ruined everything. I wanted him to know I was there as my friend, because he was. So, after you had this experience with restorative justice, did there ever come a time where you felt completely restored? Has there, have you felt that way? Not yet. <laughs> um, I think it's a long journey. I think that every survivor's journey is, is different. And like I said, a lot of the statements that were made that day, I think were a closing. And for me, it was important. Um, because really, truly, I had been defending him. Um, for almost a year up to that point because I truly thought that there was going to be some sort of medical facility, some doctors that were going to come forward that were going to prove that this was a true treatment because that's what we were told. Um, so I thought that that was going to happen. And then the child pornography piece came out and realizing that there were little girls on his computer, thousands of them. Um, I just couldn't continue that anymore. I couldn't stay on the side of trusting and believing that everything he told me was true and I had to realize that I had been tricked. And um, so it really only hit me how bad it was probably about seven months before we did our impact statements. So I was on the Team Larry side for a minute. Um, and so my journey, my really hard journey started with my impact statement. Um, so, I'm grateful for the others that got to close their door that day, and they did feel that relief of letting something go away from them, but for me, um, I think it was my darkest day. I think truly it was the worst feeling I've ever felt. But, I, again, don't think if I didn't have that opportunity, I don't think I would be where I am right now. I think I would be still really stuck. So I think having that opportunity to have that restorative justice, I can see the light at the end of the time where it wasn't there before. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Um, it's um, giving an effective impact statement is has aspects of restorative justice, but it may not be the full restorative justice experience that we might talk about later in the day. So I'm interested in when you talk about how you imagine the negative, how you would respond to it because of the conversation. In some forms of restorative justice, you would have that opportunity to have a conversation. I'm interested in your thoughts about whether that's something you welcome or if that would be too much. What your thoughts are on about the, um, um, engaging in that form of restorative justice? Um, I've actually been approached about that a lot of times um, because there's a suggestion that if he were to respond to anybody or if he were to have that open mind to talk to one of us, it would probably be me. Um, some days I think, oh hell no. <laughs> some days I think, bring it on. Some days I think, um, what would I say? Would I believe him? 
Would anything that he said change anything? <clears throat> so I'm open to the idea because I do think I know him and that he might truly <clears throat> say something to me that might be real because we've been real. But then there's another part of that. Was he ever really real? Like, was any of this real? So I go back and forth on that idea. I think that if it approached me in reality, not just in theory, um, I would have to really sit on that thought. Yes. Uh, in Kansas, we had a case, I don't know if you're familiar with this, whereby a judge in a sexual assault case ruled that the victims were aggressors and therefore um, he lessens the sentence of the offender as a result of that. There was a bill introduced in the Kansas legislature just last month that would prohibit <coughs> judges from creating a scenario making victims offend, making victims aggressors. However, the bill did not make it out of committee, and the logic was that judges needed a broad scope in order to do sentencing and they did not want to tie the, tie the hands of judges in Kansas. And I don't know how, if this is across the nation or if this is going on in other areas. I think that's just that judge. Um, that's really sad. I, you know, that's why we have appeals. And if the defendant has pled or been found guilty, the judge has no business saying what did or didn't happen. We have to deal with the facts in front of us. And why would you ever shame a survivor? That takes that victim into victimhood forever. It doesn't help heal. And I am always mindful that this black robe that I wear, that the gavel that I have in front of me, that when people watch me at this high bench, that is a lot of power. Why would I take away power from a victim? I'm hoping that judge is unseated. That is unconscionable, and why would we need to legislate that? But if we do legislate it, I think perhaps the legislation could be something um, in terms of um, the judge shall, or, you know, it's, that's even a hard one, because I, I, I've never that if the judge goes there, then the, then the plea or sentence must be nullified and to go back. Because then what the judge is really saying, if you read between the lines, is not guilty. And that's not what judges do unless it's a bench trial. Obviously, the judge paid no attention to the evidence. So I, that, I, I read about that. That was actually on Twitter a lot. It was a huge conversation. That one blew me away. I don't, I have, there is shame. Shame on that judge, shame. It's exactly the opposite of what I do. I can't tell you I'm perfect. I just know what I do works and I'm gonna keep doing it because people like Trinae come in front of me and they heal when they talk. And there's other things that I have done, you know, when I have a victim um, who needs to be a survivor and they can't come to court because they're suicidal because they, they just can't face uh, the defendant and uh, the prosecutor or a relative reads the letter they've written. Um, I make sure, and again, this is unique, and I probably am the only judge that does this as well. My county hasn't said anything yet because it costs the county money, but I think it should be legislated. Uh, what I do is I order my court reporter to give a copy of the transcript to the survivor through a therapist they're working with or a parent or whoever it is, the husband, so that when they're ready, they can read it so that they know that they were heard, listened to, believed, and defendant has been put away from them so they no longer are afraid of the boogeyman. And I can tell you that that has had a tremendous effect, positive effect. So it's another way of restorative justice that I sort of mangle into the system that is unprecedented, I'm sure, probably not liked by my commissioners because it costs money. But we need to make sure survivors heal. And what that judge did is to make sure that survivor became a victim and stayed a victim. I'm sorry that happened. Can you speak to the role of forgiveness in restorative justice? I think that's the premise of uh, 
restorative justice. And I think that forgiveness is needed for both sides to go forward. When a defendant turns to a survivor in the family and says, I'm, I'm sorry, I, never, I, I didn't know that it hurt you that bad, I didn't understand, I never will do this again, I, I promise you. I'm happy to pay for, what, for whatever, I, I know it's okay and I'll go to jail or prison. Um, it goes a long way and, and it's also, oftentimes the, um, the defendant will also say they're sorry to their family. You know, there's more involved than just the two people involved. There's a whole lot of other people and it goes a long way. And I can tell you, when there is I'm sorry from both sides, because sometimes the families of the survivor now has made threats against the um, defendant or their families. When you have that, I'm sorry across the aisle. I don't need extra law enforcement. I don't have to have both sides leaving the courtroom at separate times. I actually have seen hugging and conversations and people then working together because oftentimes they're family members and they have to go to the same weddings, funerals. They have child care relationships, you know, so the defendant might be incarcerated, but these families have to work together. So that I'm sorry and let's heal from this goes a long way. And it also goes a long way in my sentencing. Oftentimes, I hear from the defendant when I say, what would you like me to know? Basically, the gist of what they say is, I'm sorry I got caught. I can tell you, when I look at guidelines, they're getting to the top of the guidelines. Yay, you won the lottery. <laughs> That's what happens. So it means a lot to me as well. And most of the attorneys know that, but I, you, know, you get defendants who, they, they don't think they did anything wrong. It's about them. It's never going to be about any um, survivor. I had a dad, a mom, and the brother of the dad. Actually, it was a stepdad, I'm sorry. A stepdad, his brother, and a mom assault a girl for about five years. The mom was in tears, and they gave her, I think, too low of a plea deal, but I, I went with it because the girl did not want to come into court and testify that she was suicidal, and her dad was a really good guy, came and talked. And I, I struggled for about half an hour with, I should be giving these people life. Why am I going to go with this deal? But I was convinced after hearing from the father who read a letter from her and who talked to me um, on her behalf that it was in her best, in the victim's best interest to survive, to really become a, thr a thriver, which is what we want. Now, the uh, brother to the stepdad, he's still claiming innocence. He still will be in front of me in a couple of months. The stepdad, when I said, what would you like me to know, is there anything you'd like to say, he said, nope. You got the top. And what I'm also doing in all three of those cases is taking a copy of the transcript and sending it to the parole board so that hopefully when they're up for parole, the answer is no. Well, he, before I spoke, he did say, mouth to me, I'm so sorry. And I, I often wonder still what that meant. Was he sorry? What was he sorry for? Was he sorry that it was me? Was it sorry that I had to have this conversation? Um, so I've, I've gone through that in my mind a lot about what that meant. Um, have I forgiven him? No. Um, would I like to? Forgiveness goes a long way to healing, but I'm, I tend to think that, based on the letter that Nancy wrote and the comments that came to me, I don't think, I still think he thinks he did nothing wrong, and so I'm sorry is really more of, you don't understand what I did, it was the right thing, and I'm sorry you feel that way, and that's not sorry. But he is thankfully one of very few who are like that, um, to that degree. A lot of dead people out there, but um, I'm hoping that is eradicated. I, I, there's no words for it, the evil that I saw in him. But I am thankful that the girls are all healed in their own various ways. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you both for your human spirit. It's obvious and powerful and emanates. And Judge, I, I'd like your thoughts or maybe even your advice for we the people and maybe our body politic and how we might go from being a victim to a survivor to maybe a thriver in relationship to maybe similar topics. We've been talking about things like 
uh, sex crimes and human trafficking, uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case connected to this current executive branch uh, in terms of uh, Acosta and the parent uh, malfeasance of justice in relationship to the victims. And then on top of that, this issue of potential international sex trafficking, and then on top of that, potential things like human compromise, political blackmail on top of that. Do we need something similar to what you practice in your court, but maybe in a legislative context, something like truth and reconciliation, but add accountability maybe and restitution in the middle? We could call it tar, no feather, or I don't know. <laughs> I'm interested in that. I love that title. I might see one of my novels, that is that title. Um, you know, what you just uh, summed up in one big question is really a worldwide uh, question. It's an epidemic. Do I have all the answers? No. Do I believe that a starting place is conversation and healing? Yes. And I believe legislators need to get involved and pass this. Sadly, because judges aren't doing what I do, that they need to, like I said, expand the victim. We need to, to have restorative justice training. Um, we need to have it in the White House and in the Bath House. I'm sorry, wherever it is, wherever there's a house, we need to have that kind of training and thinking. So what we can all do is, at the ballot box, don't vote um, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Vote for a candidate who will restore justice in every sense of the word, because it really starts with that legislation. As much as I'd like to say it starts with all of us, as a judge, I can only do what legislators help us do. I interpret what they do. But you voters, you have the power. Use the power. And start there because there are legislators who don't believe that they should be compensated that anything happened. And, oh, this uh, this will just go away. It's not going away. <laughs> Read the newspaper. There, people will die because of the drug crisis. There's suicides every day of people who've been sexually assaulted. And I know this. I've been contacted by men and women from around the world, countries, places I didn't even know existed. And they said, in those seven days, I listened and I felt that the girls were talking about my story. And I felt your words healed me. And today I'm not committing suicide. I'm not believing. I'm not cutting. And so I know that the power of speaking, working together works. And we need to, you know, in the legislature, I worked in the Senate for 10 years from the state, under a state senator. I was an administrative assistant, did a lot of things. But I was on the Senate floor every day with them three days a week. There's always the media. Demand the media in the courtroom. Why don't you know what's going on? Do you know how many of these cases I have? This case was by far the worst by number, but not by crimes against women. I had a case where a woman was raped, burned, and beaten, and her breasts were cut. Didn't make the papers. Demand cameras in the courtroom. I'm not saying that because I think I want to be on camera. I'm there. Google me. I'm in camera. I'm in the news all the time. It doesn't matter if it's camera. They, they find me. I, I don't know. Google me. It's not about me. It's about why don't I know what's going on in the community? What's in your paper? If you compare what's in my courtroom and what's in the newspaper, you'd be shocked. I found out that there were 42 break-ins in my neighborhood because I ended up with about 26 of them on my docket. And I said, how is it I didn't know? And my neighbors didn't know. So I started talking. And I told them how it happened and what to look for and all of that. Why aren't you demanding eyes in the courtroom? Because it's your community. Like I said, you're going to have contact with judges. That's what's happening in your community. I'm not the world judge. I'm not the federal judge. I am the county judge. And the county doesn't know what I see. Why not? Go to a courtroom. It's a great education. Figure out when there's a plea and sentencing day. Watch a trial. You will be amazed. We all that education. Now, it, my answer falls short because you asked a huge question, but you all need to keep asking those same questions and saying, what can I do to help change and keep the conversation going, which is why I'm here. Keeping the conversation going. This isn't just about um, Nasser. And Trené recognizes that too with the work she does. She's expanded. This changed her life, so she's working for justice for all people who come after her. And that's what all of you need to do. We need to keep the conversation going and demand change. And openness. 
Let me spin on that just because um, with what we what I've just been dealing with, like also seeing this judge on I have received thousands of messages on my private messengers, you know, I didn't kill myself today because of you. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't know what that feels like to have somebody say that to you. But um, and, and others, people reached out to me. There was a young lady up in um, the northern part of Michigan who had been abused by a massage therapist. And she went straight to the police, covered in oil, um, and unfortunately the case was there was not enough evidence. Mm -hmm. Well, she asked media to come in. Media came in, sure enough, there were two more survivors that came forward because he was a massage therapist at one of the large hotels and they had settled with one of those survivors um, years back. And just so you know, because I think that this is another statistic I did not know, typically they're serial. They don't just abuse one. There's many before and there's going to be many after. It's not often that it's a one-time case of assault. Um, so you know, the reason that we're really trying to prompt uh, survivors to come forward and to be part of the Me Too and to the Time's Up and to the, you know, us too, we're all human, is because they always assume that it was just them. Even in our case, some of the girls, just, just me. It was just me that was happening to. It's really usually not. So when you come forward or a survivor comes forward to speak on that, there's, there's going to be more. Like in ours, there were hundreds, and there are hundreds more, just so you know. It's not just the 333 plus 170. There's thousands more. Uh, because he had access. He was a doctor, an Olympic doc doctor. But in most cases, they're serial. So just if, as attorneys or wherever you're going in this field, and, and what she spoke about, about having the media, have the media. Because those survivors of this case would never have known that this man was even up for this, or that this only happened to them in their thought, if the media wouldn't have put out a story about him, how he got off. That's when they started filtering him. Like, this one girl, she won't get her justice, but she'll be able to support the others in getting him off the streets. The other thing is, and maybe we should illustrate it, is that, and this is how school bus drivers, uh, hot priests, all these people who are serial rapists get away with this is that when there's a complaint, they're transferred. There needs to be a law that says you can't transfer. You can put them on leave because we have justice in the system, innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So put them on paid leave if you need to. But do not transfer them until there's resolution because then we have serial rapists along you know, every bus route, every church, all of that. And the other thing is demand that rape kits um, be tested within 14 days max. If you, can, if you go to the hospital, you can have blood results. I went a few weeks ago and I had a panel of, I don't know, 20 tests or something. About 11 of them came back with that same day and the rest came back within three days. Why does it take uh, years and dust settling on boxes to test rape kits? That just allows, that is saying, we don't care, let the rapists continue. 14 days is plenty of time. And they say there's not enough money. Each kit takes a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Well, we got a five hundred. They got a five hundred million dollar settlement out of Michigan State. Probably should have been more. But anyway, five hundred million. Divide that by fifteen hundred. How many rape kits is that? How much help is that? They're thinking on the back end. Think on the front end. Let's stop rape by taking it seriously and demanding every person have a same kit, the sexual assault nurse does the same kit, that it be tested and results given. And I know of a case where the police did not proceed because the victim didn't want to, the victim was the mother, the daughter didn't want to, the, if the victim was the daughter, the mother did not want to proceed on behalf of the daughter because the DNA, the rape kiss showed it was the dad. That information should have been turned over to CPS that child should have been removed. A lot of missteps there. We need to look at all these issues. Work with your legislators. Well, and on the rape kits, just because um, we are the, first off, my child has found his voice. <laughs> so I'm sorry. He's not mad. He's just talking. <laughs> and I was going to this on the airplane yesterday. It was really awesome. Um, but uh, with the undetected rape kits, um, people assume that those are just a one-off. 
there were 860 repeat offenders in those 11,000 rape kits. And it's a national database, and what was happening was is that they were digging all over. So this kit got processed, these offenders went into this database, and all of a sudden they were having these dings of the same accused, or the same abuser, same rapist, abusing and raping in other states, multiple states. So, yes, please push to have these rape kits processed. Um, obviously, a survivor can suggest they don't want the kit processed. And in one case of ours, again, exactly the same, a little girl came in for a rape kit. They had 72 hours to decide if they wanted it processed. They decided they didn't. Her kit was one of the tested rape kits of 20 years later, because that's how old some of these were. And in her rape kit, there were two DNAs. One was the father. So they decided to not have her kit processed <clears throat> because of whoever the first person that raped her was, but they decided to not do it because there was a <coughs> One, 20 years she was getting used by her father. And one other point, check and work with um, legislators again to work with insurance companies. There are a number of cases where insurance companies, because someone was assaulted multiple times or they were assaulted in the past and then they get assaulted again, which is sadly not uncommon, they called it a pre existing condition and refused to cover it. Those insurance companies need to be run out of town and into the ground. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Yes, um, as, a, as a lawyer who was raised by a state court judge with the first name Monty and who was given the nickname Maximum Monty, I'm curious to know what your experience with the de defense bar has been and whether you see any of their arguments as cogent in terms of not allowing so many people to speak. I'm just curious what their, what their pushback might be. Um, with me, there is pushback from the defense um, letting so many um, survivors speak. And so let's talk just about Nassar. And this happens in a, in a lot of my cases because they know that I'm letting everybody speak, right? Yes. And they know, oh my gosh, if she hears all that, yep, it's going to be, you know, my sentences are harsh. Google, Google me. It's not, it's not the only time I've done this. I mean, I've given worse sentences. This is pretty mild, okay? But, um, so the defense does not want that to happen, but no one has appealed me on it, and it's balanced because I also allow the defendant to talk and defendant's mother, grandmother, sister, okay. whatever. The pushback, sadly, has been with the sheriff. Doesn't want, well, now we have a new sheriff, but the other sheriff just did not like me um, in my ways. But yes, the, the, uh, the sheriff, it would take too long, the Michigan Department of Corrections wanted their people back, or whatever it was. They just didn't want all of that to happen and thought that you know the family and all of that of the defendant shouldn't be allowed to talk. And in one particular case, I got in trouble because a young offender, he was about 19, and the only thing he asked, he said he was sorry, he was remorseful for everything, and his grandmother was dying, and he knew that by the time he got out, um, grandma would be dead, and he said, could I just please hug my grandmother, she's, she's got cancer, she'll be dead in a year. And I let them hug. And the sheriff came over and said, you shall not. And I said, well, it's my courtroom, I'm going to do it. He said, what's the safety risk? I said, you know what, I have mean, terrorism training, and if your people do your job and check people, a hug can stop a bullet. Why don't you think about that? And he reported me and did all sorts of things. So you never, you, I'm always surprised where the bullets come at me. I'm just going to keep doing what I do because they have works and the defense bar overall because I give their clients time and because I listen to some of their arguments that are damn silly but they are a lot but everybody in my courtroom make a record um, they're okay with it I think they don't mind it yes. um, I just wanted to go back to your um, talk about PR for restorative justice and um, there's a big push um, here in Lawrence, actually, um, to completely reform a retributive system of justice that is focused on punishment um, and takes that entire cultural shift to really create a restorative community that uses restorative practices and justice. And we've talked about 
what I, my, my cons our concern is is the idea of what if we do it badly and what if we don't get the right message about restorative justice out and then people think that restorative justice isn't going to work because they think all restorative justice is is a victim impact statement and that's all there is and something doesn't work about that and then it, so i'm just wondering about like how do do you have any thoughts about how to counteract making sure we do it the right way, not in a half-assed manner? Yes, we need to have we need to rely on experts. You should have people like today um, who are survivors. You need to have legislators. You need to have a panel of really and well-educated um, people to put together the proper program. As lawyers, um, and I don't know how many of you have gone through this, but when I was doing mediation, I had to do I did civil and um, family and I did uh, mediation. There was a segment about how to deal with people who have domestic violence and those kinds of things. So there are experts, and you need to have those expert components um, so that you can have something. And it's probably going to be by trial and error. There is nothing perfect in what we do. Uh, Trina and I compare notes all the time. We teach each other things all the time. You need to really have a pile of those experts, not a whole bunch of people. Say, yeah, this is a great idea, let's do it, and you put something in place that backfires because that would be the worst. One more question. I'm wondering what kind of uh, preparation you had before you read your letter, before you went to the stand and had a conversation. Was there preparation for you with other people, and what did it look like? Um, we had a meeting that Monday about um, the survivors that were going to speak, and at that point still I was on the fence of whether or not I was going to do that. And um, Angie Pavolet is the prosecutor. She had suggested putting, I know this sounds stupid, but putting a picture of him, printing it or putting it on your computer, and saying everything that you needed to say to him, to his face, on the computer or wherever it needed to be. Because walking into the courtroom, and cameras and, and him specifically um, preparing what you needed to say to him before it was actually live because I think that there was a lot of fear in what we were going to do. Like there was going to be the lack of speakers to be able to speak to him because they got the hurt and saw him for the first time. It was scary. So really the, first, the only suggestion that we really had was to, to talk to him to his face somewhere else first. Um, but a lot of practice, honestly. I, I revised my statement so many times um, because I had so many things to say and it went in all different directions. So um, I think I finally narrowed it down to what was most important to me to say to him. And, and I practiced for my husband, I practiced for my mom, um, how to do that. But really, truly, there was no like specific instructions other than this. And keep in mind um, what I did in this particular case because I needed security and I had, I added about a hundred extra chairs and I did a lot of things that probably violated rules and I just told the court administrator, don't look, this is what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and so I had uh, Nancy in the witness chair so that each sister survivor came up and actually faced him. The normal situation, what you saw in the other courtroom where the fight broke out, um, normal situation is that counsel is at counsel table and the victim comes up to the podium and talks to the judge, but the defendant is at counsel table. So if they want to face him, they have to turn around. And a lot of them are scared to do that. Some of them do. Some of them say, can I address him? And then they face him. But then we have a court reporter problem. And I thought this case, when I realized, you have to understand, when they first came to me and said, will you take the plea? And I said, yes, but you know my practice is I let everybody speak. And they said, well, you know, there's 125 or whatever. I said, I mean everybody. And I don't care how long it's going to take. And the defense counsel said, well, we don't want the doctor to talk, we don't want this, and they had all this, and I said, well, then you appeal me, you make your record, I'm going to let everybody talk. And so understanding it early on that there were going to be about 30 people talk, uh, I had them in that stand. Ultimately, each 
person in power in the next and the next. So we had the 156 and ultimately the 169, but it was a great thing that they were eye to eye, not turning around. So I would hope that, and I would do that again in, in a case where it was that uh, intense, even if there were only half a dozen. Um, usually when there's one, we can deal with it, but um, when there's a couple, I think the best thing is that the defendants sit in the chair next to his lawyer because he has constitutional right to do that. Um, but it was important that, and Trinae can answer this, I think, um, that she be eye to eye to him, not distracted and turning around. That would not have, um, I don't think that would have worked well or been as impactful. Yeah, I, th I, th I know some of the ladies that did speak before me had, had said that they had were too scared to look at him, so they looked at Judge Aquilina. And I had told him, you look at him or look at me. Yeah, where I went in completely to have that conversation with him, 100%. So I would have <coughs> wanted to turn to have that to him had he not been in front of me, but it was extremely helpful because she was like a safe space in case talking to him, excuse me, got too much, um, where at least I knew I had her, I didn't know her, and she's scary. <laughs> but then, and I didn't know, I didn't know how it was going to be for me, so having her as an option plan B was super important. Please join me in thanking Judge Rathlina.
it's time for a break. <laughs>